Thanks very much, Paul. Yeah, Peter has uh, been with us here in the faculty in the uh, in the architecture discipline for a little over a year and a half now. We were really delighted when we were able to attract her here for the next phase in her career because she's a real leader uh, and a facilitator and supporter around key themes of sustainability, contributing to fragile societies, and uh, contributing to UN sustainable development goals around sustainability, which is a, a real theme for our architecture school and, a, and it's a, a point of distinction for our architecture school here. So she's a wonderful support, uh, support and leader around that. I know you've already had a chance to read her biography, but I don't think an introduction is complete without the, um, someone mentioning it be, before, the, before the meeting. And so you will have read. Um, she's an architectural theorist, researcher, and creative practitioner, which, which is quite broad, actually. So she's contributed in many ways in her career so far. Her research projects have investigated the significance of mutual relationships between digital technologies, emergence, ethics, and innovation in architecture. She has been involved in projects funded through the Australian Research Council, which is all about research projects, the Office of Learning and Teaching, which is about supporting uh, undergraduate and postgraduate education, and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, all of which have employed creative practice research as a mode of investigation. She has a creative research practice herself called Onomata Pia and leads the Cross-Institutional Effective Environments Laboratory. Her creative work and writing have been published widely in international contexts, including two edited books, the titles of which you can read in her biography there. So I'll stop there because with that biography read out, uh, I'm sure you're very keen now to hear her talk. Welcome, Pia. We're all looking forward to your talk. Take it away. Thank you so much, Brett, um, for that. Um, and and um, Paul Jeans also for that introduction. Um, and before I go on, I also just really want to thank Stuart Midgley and Eugenie Lumbers and Natalie there as well for um, helping to, to set all of this up. It's been um, really great. And I um, I feel really honoured to be here, I have to say. I just want to say that first. Um, I've been really enjoying doing some research into the, um, into the history of the Royal Society in New South Wales since Brett asked me to speak, which has been really fascinating. I... Um, grew up in Western Australia, which I guess is the place that's kind of in my bones, but I've also spent the last 20 years in Victoria. Um, I've only just, as Brett said, just recently taken the position um, at the University of Newcastle. So the Royal Society of New South Wales hasn't been on my radar and it's been really great to be introduced to that and read some of that history. And my family... Um, Links to New South Wales, however, do go back to the late 1800s because my great grandfather, John Edney Brown, was an arboriculturalist from Scotland, and he was um, he arrived in 1875 to take up the position of conservator of forests in South Australia. But he then came up to New South Wales to be appointed to a similar position, and this was at the time, according to my research, that he was the pres uh, that um, Henry Chamberlain Russell was the president of um, the society. Uh, and he had, in 1877, I discovered, published a book called The Climate of New South Wales, which I really have to read because it's got some fantastic stuff in there about flooding in the Hunter. He was from the Hunter um, Valley. And I've been fantasising about a dialogue between those two men, which probably never occurred, of course, but um, because uh, uh, John Edward Brown had a theory of climate that was related to the fact that uh, he was pretty sure that deforestation reduced rainfall and that trees or forests attracted the rain. Um, and this was a, uh, an intellectual feud he was having with someone at the time. So anyway, I've been having these <laughs> um, fantasies about my, my, some sort of historical connection I might, I might have. But tonight what I'm talking about um, is uh, architecture and the cultivation of vitality. Um, or to put in other words, or in other ones, how we might think about the relationship between designing places and a sense of well-being. I need to say up front that there have been many attempts in research settings um, to offer a clear guidelines for designing um, for well-being. My, my email's going off, I really ought to shut that down. Um, but um, my research into that research uh, leads me to pretty strongly hold the view that we can't convincingly uh, pin down simple cause and effect relations between the nature of a building as a thing and the well-being of its occupants. 
because the reason for that is that we're dealing with relationships between buildings, environments, and their human inhabitants, and that that in and of itself is an irreducible complexity. So I hope to demonstrate in this presentation tonight um, how and why this points to the strength and significance of architecture as a tool of well-being, in fact, um, rather than it being its weakness. And um, if we can find new ways to approach that complexity. So in the presentation tonight, I'm, I, I really want to make um, a case partly through an extremely specific research story um, for how architecture might be approached um, as a practice that cultivates vitality. And that, um, that practice isn't just relevant to architects, it's relevant to all citizens because it's largely about ways of approaching, um, approaching the built environment and the relationships we cultivate with it. That said, you know, the architectural profession obviously does have an important role in potentially guiding those relationships. Before I go any further, um, I want to just for a moment acknowledge country and, and pay my deep respects to the Pambalong clan of the Awabakal people as traditional custodians of the land on which the University of Newcastle's Callaghan campus stands where I work. It's actually not where I'm standing right now. I'm currently in Melbourne. Um, but so I want to pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. In many respects, the research I'm presenting tonight also is my way of paying respects to Indigenous practices of care for the country um, and to Indigenous ontological relationships to the land. So I'm going to bring up my slides now. So I'm beginning here with this slide um, by, uh, of an article from Aileen Morton Robinson who's an Aboriginal woman of the Goempal tribe and, and a professor of Indigenous research. Um, she's spoken really clearly um, and beautifully here and elsewhere about the ontological disturbance that's wrought upon um, Australia's first people by colonisation and the need for us all to open ourselves up to a much more, <laughs> if you like, fairly distributed um, disturbance. And the work I'm, I'm presenting tonight does set out to cultivate a related disturbance. Um, one that's aimed at well-being um, in ways that I've gone to discuss. But I think it's really important that I make clear that um, I'm not claiming to hold any deep understanding of Indigenous practices of care for country, because I don't, uh, and I'm not trying to cultivate the same kind of ontological disturbance either. But I do see it as related, and my hope is that it sort of quietly and without making any great claims moves the shoes of colonisation towards a more open space if you like, in which we might be more receptive to the ontological disturbance that Robinson speaks about. So the connection between Indigenous practices of care for country and well-being, which is what I'm trying to get to this evening in a roundabout way, is beautifully summarised in the words of um, Deborah Bird Rose, where she says, Aboriginal people are situated within their own country emotionally, psychologically, and metaphysically, when the country is well, people are likely to be well too. So I would say that that's a kind of holistic approach to, to well-being, um, and that's those, that sort of approach, especially as integrated with the environments that we inhabit, are pretty more or less counter to Western worldviews, and we tend to think of our bodies as um, discrete entities with minimal overlap with the so-called um, environment, which is something that's meant to be around us rather than something that's part of, um, that's something we can't separate from ourselves. Okay? And certainly the major or dominant tropes of academic research, which tends to reduce, fragment and isolate things in order to study them clearly, is often not great at working with complex holes. And you know, it has to be said that Western research has led to the development of very powerful technologies with often uh, exceptionally positive outcomes in health, for instance, um, you know, our capacity to treat and cure many afflictions has never been so advanced. And so I'm, I'm not trying to dismiss anything there, um, but it has to be said that the worldview underpinning these approaches is at the same time creating populations that are sick and depressed and 
we now know, as science tells us, that climate change is also moving faster and more destructively than we'd anticipated. And I would argue that the worldviews that underpin them have, have taken us to this place. The ontological is, is, is something we need to look at very closely. So I would say that we would do well to find ways to cultivate the kind of connection that Bird Rose describes in this passage. And Indigenous Australians have been doing ongoing research in and with country for more than 60,000 years, but the process through which they developed and acquired knowledge, and I'm talking very much about the process of the acquisition of knowledge, that process of doing that, is most often not recognised as research, um, which I think is something that we, says something about the limited scope, the narrow understanding of what counts as research. And that's something which is close to my heart because as a creative practice researcher, we're often not seen as being real researchers. This, I'm going to take a leap now. Um, this is to the Newcastle Conservatorium, which is where I first delivered a version of this presentation. Um, I have to say that it's been really hard doing a version of this presentation for um, a webinar <laughs> um, because when I did the presentation in this building, I was very much, um, it was very much about presence and being in that space and also connection with people that were there and I haven't been able to do that. So I had to modify this whole talk um, a little bit to, in the hope that I can convey what I was trying to convey. But I bring up this building because because it was the setting and it is a setting for the delivery of a lecture. And there are many things we could say about this building as an example of an architectural example of its history, its proportions, its volume, et cetera. But one of the things that this space really obviously does is that it sets up a focus on, on that stage, which is where I was standing. There were no pianos that night. <laughs> and, um, I want to bring up then this quote from Shakespeare's As You Like It. All the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. So to some extent, we could see this as a model of the way the world, the way the West constructs the world. Um, humans on a stage in which human action is the focus and centre of attention. Now, a word for this is anthropocentrism which as many of you know, here's two definitions, considering human beings as the most significant entity of the universe and two, interpreting or regarding the world in terms of human values, experience and benefit. By contrast, um, to come back to the words of Deborah Bird Rose, um, for Indigenous Australians, there is a profound sense that this world was not created specifically for human beings. Wisdom for humans lies in being aware of the life systems and in behaving responsibly so as to sustain the created world. By contrast, again, the stage um, as a model of the world isn't meant to be noticed in and of itself. I mean, the, the, the stage, um, the action here is framed and focused by the interior and there are a whole lot of architectural devices going on here to focus one's attention down onto that stage. But the stage itself as a flat platform is just meant to serve the action of the human. Um, it's just by being flat and unobtrusive. And this runs through the, the assumptions of the way we construct architecturally the Western world. And um, this is a, uh, I love this drawing because it, it demonstrates how, has, in a way, the degree to which it underpins the flatness of the stage, if you like, or the world as a flat stage underpins so many assumptions we make. This is a drawing by some architects, Araka and Gins, study for a baseball field, the architectural body. I think it really shows that so much of what we do and so many of the environments we inhabit is predicated on this idea of the fat, flat, passive backdrop. Um, but what happens, as, you know, as we can see here, when the, when the ground becomes active, um, it changes the rules of the game. The, the game would have to change. Baseball would not be the same. And many of the rules of the game change when the world in and of itself becomes less of a passive backdrop and more of an active player in the game. So Eric Hungins, um, as architects, took these ideas a lot further than most. They moved from vitality through to immortality. Um, but 
which is not where I'm wanting to go. But to link back to Eileen Morton Robinson, they believed in disturbance effectively as one could say ontological disturbance as a way to get to the, that vitality and that architecture was the best way for getting there. They really believed that. They were actually originally poets and artists, but that, uh, a poet and a painter, but they, they became architects because they believed it was the only way they were going to bring vitality to the world. Um, and it does seem consequential to me to go back to the, to the stage that Shakespeare, the Shakespearean character in that play was a melancholy figure. Uh, it, he was a depressive. And, and anthropocentrism, it seems to me, is depressing because it weakens relationships beyond the human and to other forms of life. And we caught, I, I think, in the melancholy of anthropomorphism. And it was a talk about depression that helped clarify for me how to think about vitality as something to aspire to. Um, this is Andrew Solomon, and it's an often quoted phrase from him, actually, the opposite of depression is not happiness, but vitality. It's in depression that we feel alone and we feel cut off, um, where everything loses its meaning, whereas vitality, on the other hand, is connection. And it's connection that is seen to be primarily about social contact um, with other humans, which is undeniably important, but contact with other, both, uh, with other living things and, I would say, non-living things um, has been shown to be beneficial to health and well-being. So, I mean, there's lots of research about built environments with natural light and views of gardens and plants um, have it shown to be beneficial for the well-being of, for instance, patients in hospitals and office workers. Um, but, I mean, the question is well, sort of why? Why is that? Why does it do that? And it seems to me that all these examples across the research of, of things that people pinpoint as being um, about well-being or leading to greater well-being is that they have a connection and contact with life beyond oneself. They, they connect us to things beyond. Um, uh, and, and, and it's through that connection we feel more alive because we can feel the life that's within us by connecting to life that's outside of us, if that makes sense. Hmm. So it, it seems to me that that's kind of the secret of vitality is this connection. Um, of course, it's complex and it's not just any contact and connection and there are connections which can be destructive and alienating. So we kind of need to think about that, you know, the kind of connections that we're setting up and the nature of the relationships we're setting up. So, again, I return to Deborah Bird Rose where she says, country ideally is synonymous with life. A healthy or good country is one in which all the elements do their work. They all nourish each other because there is no site, no position from which, from which the interest of one can be disengaged from the interests of others in the long term. So to some extent, she's talking about relationships that are multiple and ecological as, as, a, as something that is important. So what I'm going to, um, what I want to argue for now is through the research that I've been doing is approach and an approach towards this. Um, I, I, it's, it doesn't look like in what I'm doing that I have I'm talking about Indigenous issues at all, and I'm not, um, and it's not about um, Indigenous practices of care for country, but it, 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 they are techniques that I do hope um, just get under the skin and shift a little bit the very thoroughly ingrained Western modes of framing life through architecture and other means through sort of a more holistic to a more holistic way of approaching the world. Uh, and basically, it's it's really most of the approach I'm doing is about um, approach. So we mostly live in urban settings. We inhabit buildings the vast majority of our lives, particularly at the moment, where, and particularly in Melbourne at the moment, we are locked inside pretty much. Um, and this is the ecological condition that we need to reappraise. Uh, it, it is the built environment, is, is that. Um, it frames that. It is, it is an integral part of it in any way, in any case. And if there's one concept that summarises the kinds of relationships that I think do foster and cultivate vitality for absolutely everyone involved and, and across an ecology, it's care. 
So I will now move to this example in which I want to try to demonstrate a little bit about how I've approached the ideas that I've just been talking about um, and the um, acts of care and connection and trying to see life in the world beyond myself and in non-human places. So we don't often think about a building as being alive, um, but and I don't think that they are. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that a building is alive in the same way, but I do think that, that there is life flowing through them um, and that life is in the world and beyond us in these ways. So this is a picture of Avery Green. Um, the name, which is the name I gave to this house, this is two images from the inside of the house um, after um, she'd been, um, after I'd finished the project and, and, the, and the renovation and extension had occurred. The way in which the project was framed um, was uh, through these three Janes, or at least these Janes influenced me and um, three white women, I have to say, called Jane, um, who shaped my thinking significantly. One, and I'll just read through these quotes, and I think you will all see the connections between these and all the stuff I've been trying to just set up right now. Um, the first is Jane Goodall, and she'd been in the Gombe um, for a year on her own, completely without human companionship. And she writes, I found myself saying good morning to my little hut on the peak, hello to the stream where I collected my water. So the, the hut becomes alive, a life, if you like. And Jane Bennett, where she says, uh, who's a um, philosopher um, in America, she says, maybe it's worth running the risks associated with anthropomorphizing because it, oddly enough, works against anthropocentrism. A chord is struck between person and thing. So if you're doing something like naming a house and, and, and calling it a person, you are anthropomorphizing effectively. And Jane Jacobs, um, who was a great American woman who um, up who upturned a lot of planning, um, top-down planning um, in America and, and brought in the idea of um, attention to the street and to the people in the street. And she says, and what is a habitat? It's an intricate, complicated web of interdependencies. Three Janes. And these Janes um, have come together for me in what I call the Jane approach, which is essentially... Um, what I see as being my research method, the Jane approach, um, and has led to the research question, can a building be a person? Now, that might um, sound absurd, and I think to me even for a long time that sounded pretty absurd, but um, I had a hunch that I had to keep stay with it um, because the more I looked into the concept of person, um, the more I realise that a person is not always human. Uh, and it's also pretty notable that many humans were not always considered to be a person, in fact, like slaves, women, children, historically have not had legal personhood. And if we consider this to be abhorrent now, it might be worth reviewing the idea that buildings are generally considered to be property, just like wives used to be. <laughs> I would also point out that um, there are, is what I would call the personhood movement has been rising for the last eight years or so. We have rivers now um, have been given legal personhood, some mountains, a number of natural features, if you like, have been given rights and responsibility, uh, rights of, of personhood. So I eventually convinced myself that it wasn't such a big stretch and that um, I would approach this project of this of redoing this house, if you like, um, through that question, can a house be a person? And that effectively, just asking that question, changed my relationship with that building. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a history of, of Avery and this house. This is the house in 2007. I lived there for six years with my daughter across her primary school years. And that was the condition it was in when um, I bought the house and also when um, throughout the whole time we lived there. The house um, is a Victorian house, 
um, but it's not pure Victorian. It's it's a mongrel. So you can see the facade there. It used to have a beautiful stately Victorian facade and that was ripped down um, and rebuilt in the 50s. And you can, but you can see inside the house that she's, um, you know, got all of the old um, Victorian uh, features, you know, the long corridor and the arch and um, the ornamented ceiling roses and such forth. And these are all, you know, familiar architectural refrains of the Victorian genre. And the setting of the house is uh, just, you can see that there and um, her there and in this big old map, um, she's located somewhere in here, which sort of tells us about the fact that she's sitting on clay, which becomes important to the story. Um, early on in the project, I had to, I was asked to do a, a TED talk about the project and uh, um, so, and it hadn't begun. And I was also seeking out names at the time for a while. She was called Eleanor, um, little while Avery, uh, Ava, Evergreen, but I, I had to settle on a name at that point. And I'm not going to go into this in nearly as much depth as I could here, but the act of naming was also a technique and a strategy that I found to be very important um, in, in forming relationships. But it was during the process of, of doing this uh, that all sorts of things emerged. So, for instance, as I demolished the kitchen, which was here, um, what emerged from under the lining of the walls was on the stud work were these pictures of little girls drawn um, on, onto, onto the timber. And then there was this little inscription, age 11, 1955, and the name of the person, which I'm not going to say for privacy reasons, but, and this um, little ad here is, is the Bernie board that was on top of the stud work um, that, that, that had come down. So it was a bit of an archaeological dig. And we did, after quite a lot of sleuth work, we did track down this, this little girl, now a 70-year-old woman, um, who came to the house just after I finished the project and as I had a sort of a launching exhibition inside the house. Um, and it was a, yeah, it was a it was a fairly amazing moment, but for her and and for me. But the the important thing here is that as I was doing the project, as I was as I was, um, it, many things emerged which informed the way in which it was it was done. It certainly it um, it informed how I thought about the house, but also my relationship to it. So this is a picture of it after we'd finished the demolition, we're about to start rebuilding. And it was just sort of at this point um, where I was kind of terrified because I, unlike what in normally in architecture, what you do is you, you do all of the drawings and including the details and you get it all done and et cetera, et cetera. And all I had done at this point was enough drawings to get through planning. So it was just one to 100 drawings. Uh, there was no details. It, the materials were still in some places quite vague. And I was working with two carpenters who, and I was the owner builder. So um, I took three months off work and I was on site every day. Um, on this project, which is also unusual for architects because they're not normally involved in the building process to that extent. But that was really important because what I was trying to do with this research project by asking that question was to say, can the design agency, can the way in which this renovation and extension emerges be informed by the house itself? Is there something about the house that can that can do that? Is it not just about me? Um, imprinting something on the house. So um, a little bit terrifying, but I leapt in and what it pointed to was the design agency. Like as an architect, you have all the design agency, let's say, but I was looking at a different kind of agency. Jane Bennett writes about the kind of thing I was trying to get to very well here. And she says, agency is, I believe, distributed across a mosaic but it is also possible to say something about the kind of striving that may be exercised by a human within the assemblage. This exertion is perhaps best understood on the model of riding a bicycle on a gravel road. One can throw one's weight this way or that, inflect the bike in one direction or towards one trajectory of motion, 
but the writer is but one accident operative in the moving whole. And that's what I felt like. I was riding a bicycle, but and I was making all sorts of decisions that, of course, influenced this hugely and was um, a major part of it. But things were getting thrown up as I went and they were, I was as much as I could trying to fold that into the process. And a lot of this then became how do you, how do you listen to the house? How do you, I mean, the house can't talk to you. Um, so beyond observation, what can you hear? What sort of things can I can pick up? And I honestly felt a lot of the time like I was making it up um, to be really honest, but there were plenty of things that also came up that I'm not, I'm not even going to be able to get even close to talking to you about all of them um, because we will run out of time. It, it was a, a very sort of complex project in many ways. But what I thought I would do tonight then, just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about here, is to tell one story. And it's the story of the cracking in the house that, um, that led me really to, to one of the major design decisions, I suppose, that I had not pre-planned, that was definitely not part of those one to 100 drawings that the, the council um, planning department had approved. Um, and so uh, it's a good example. It's one example of many, in fact, um, but it's, I think it's probably one of my favourites. So I'm going to just going to read this little story that I wrote um, about what happened, um, about the cracking. So in the weeks prior to construction work beginning, I picked up a book called H is for Hawk by Helen MacDonald. MacDonald's relationship um, with a hawk named Mabel, which was the subject of the book, um, I was became sure was like my relationship with the house. H is for hawk, is for house, for various reasons I won't go into. It's an unusual kind of book. It's part historical biography, part nature writing and part autobiographical memoir. Um, and for various reasons, this book felt like a companion. It, it helped me to, um, in a loose manner, to feel the house as a creature, um, like a hawk with whom my relationship was developing curiously and in a way that would not neatly map onto human-animal relationships. There was one passage in um, about uh, MacDonald's relationship with Mabel that, that caught me um, where she says, I love Mabel. But what passes between us is not human. There is a kind of coldness that allows interrogators to put cloth over the mouths of men and pour water into their lungs and let them believe that this is not torture. Now, it caught my eye because um, Avery as a house was extremely cold. I remember someone walking into the house um, uh, in the scorching summer's heat one day and say, commenting on how good the air conditioning was, and it, there was no air conditioning in that house. Um, it was extremely cold in winter. Uh, it was blue stone foundations, double brick walls. The bricks were made of this dense, finely grained red clay, incredibly dense and incredibly fine and very a lot of mass. But And most likely that clay was dug from a, a brickworks clay pit which operated at the turn of the century, um, now a park that's 10, that's 10 minutes walk away from that house. So it seems like she is quite literally of the earth on which she stands. That's the bricks. She's sitting on clay. She was um, 100 years old in form, but she was even older in substance. It felt to me like her age was a deep brick well that sucked heat into an unreachable clay pit from which she had arisen. This wasn't the same kind of coldness of the torturer that MacDonald found in Mabel. This was the coldness of a different kind of unreachability or distance, one that plummets first into the depth of time and into a different kind of time altogether. It was certainly in her own time that she was always moving and cracking. The ceilings were landscapes unto themselves, thick laden plaster that had buckled and swayed and several sections of it actually fell 
um, to the ground when we were in it a couple of times. The ceiling um, had become this sort of volatile landscape that occasionally erupted. Now, the summary statement from the geologist's soil report which was done in 2015, states that the volcanic origin and depth of clay indicates a high soil reactivity and seasonal heave potential. So this, um, at the time, uh, caught my eye and the ceiling, it occurred to me that the ceilings and its, rose, and its ceiling roses spoke of these forces that stir deeply in the clay like these ancient pre-verbal memories erupting to remind the present of the past. Um, the cracks, it seemed to me, called for attention. The Victorian ceiling roses and ornamental cornices sat like dry crinkling frosting over the registration of deep geological time. Now through a process of installing a new safe and flat ceiling, the old ceiling rose had to be destroyed, triggering an exploration of how we might replace the lost rose with two new ones one for each of two parts of the living space. So after this really extended design process involving many dead ends and coupled with, um, uh, with a gradually amplifying idea of the ceiling as a form of landscape, because it did feel like a cracking landscape, um, I sourced a mountain form and um, with my uh, some assistance, we developed a crater and a mountain. So this took me back to the soil report and the previously curious statement about volcanic origin of the clay. And at the time of receiving the, the report, I was fixated by the high soil reactivity and seasonal heave potential because that sounded quite um, uh, like it was going to be difficult to deal with the footings. Um, but the, the emergence of um, the volcano-like crater as part of the design process took me back to that statement and, and thinking about the volcanic origin of that clay and that the cracking brick walls by then um, mostly passed it over, of course, at that stage sort of opened up in significantly new ways. So these mountainous and, and volcanic ceiling roses became what I call the um, over-the-top terrain where her heave potential, as it was said in the soil report, had flowered into something like this sort of efflorescent deja vu, where this sort of deep past, present and the future all folded into this complex vitality form, I would call it, um, that was contracting and expanding through geological time, through material behaviour and through house time. The folding movement linked the present and the past of the soil and the bricks, the cracking of the walls and the ceilings, the new ceiling fixtures, the curiosity and design instincts of myself and my um, assistants, and the simple physical behaviour and formal representations amongst other things. And all of this, it seemed to me, all of this seemed to be coming into this sort of complex flowering of personality that the project ended up feeling like it was about, I decided that she was, you know, to ask the question, can she be a person? But I didn't know how to answer that question. But through the process, <clears throat> a personality grew and emerged. And this is an um, image <clears throat> of the house um, that I had made up. Um, and I had little bookmarks made, a house of many stories. And you can see here I've told you one story of these uh, these two ceiling roses in that space, but there was a lot. And this down here is the story of the of the little girl drawing in the walls. And I had a clock made with her name. And th there's endless stories. And there was jewelry on her walls through the light in the, in the sun and such forth. Um, and I'm not going to go into any more of them, but they were all things that emerged as part of it. And through which I came to understand the development of her personality as part of the act of transforming her. Uh, and that um, obviously uh, there's another story then about the fact that I needed to sell the house and all of this sort of thing and, you know, does that make her a slave again? But the, um, 
it was a story that takes me, that then actually took me, really resonated when I started to really think about about our relationship with the land that we inhabit, um, the places that we feel connected to, and if there are other ways in which we can form connections with um, the places we inhabit that might lead to richer um, and more fruitful uh, ways of being in the world that I think, as I was trying to argue in the beginning, leads to greater well-being because we are we do have that connection to life beyond ourselves so i might end it there um i think that's enough of me just talking into a screen and see if there's any questions thank you um pia for a wonderful talk that's very touching um, so my name is Natalie. I will be sharing this Q and A session. So, um, so if anyone have a question, can I please um, ask that you put in, in Q and A channels instead of the chat room? So let me check the Q and A channel. So at the moment we don't have any question. So maybe I might start it with my first question. Um, have you heard of Feng Shui? And so basically that's just Chinese or the Eastern studies of um, architecture or somehow, I guess, the energies, balance in the place. So is your research somehow related to that in a way as well? Yeah, I mean, I find um, um, Feng Shui as a system for understanding architecture fascinating. Um, I haven't studied it deeply, but I have, I know uh, enough to know that, um, I think that it provides um, a really interesting lens through which to see the the building as a kind of like an energetic entity, um, which is sort of close to the kinds of things that I was talking about, but but obviously different. And I would say that that would be um, a, a different kind of lens, but uh, an equally interesting one that certainly does focus on well-being uh, in terms of the environment and the human. Thank you, Pia. Um, we have a question from Eugenie Lumbers. So she said, it's a lovely talk, thank you. And she really enjoyed it. So her question is that, how much does evergreen change you? How much, or did evergreen change me? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I, I think um, she changed me a lot. Uh, and I do actually write a little bit about the degree to which I might have transformed her, but she transformed me in turn. And that's really partly because, I mean, obviously you learn so much by going through that process and, you know, you wouldn't do a research project unless you were going to learn a lot through it. Um, but I haven't been able to really inhabit um environments in the same way since so the things that I learned in that and through the process of trying to reconsider um, what a building could be um, then transfers obviously into other situations and I have actually started this little I started a little project called houses with names um, and I've become fascinated by this quite Victorian um, uh, habit of naming houses and there's there's a lot of that sort of, uh, it's really fascinating what people decide to call their houses. Um, so my attention has changed, I suppose. Uh, what I attend to, uh, in the same way that when I started architecture school, uh, um, I found after a year or two that the world looked entirely different um, than it had before I started. And I think she was like another architecture degree for me that took me in a different direction. Just inspire you, I guess. Um, so we have another question from Ken Dawson. So Ken said, thank you for your lecture, Pia. Um, you talk about naming houses and buildings, but this is a very traditional past time. Do you have any insight why, as to why this seed, this, why this naming stopped? Oh, why the naming stopped? Um, I did um, 
I mean, I think part of the history of that from memory is that uh, before houses had numbers, names were very important. And at some point, you know, houses were called things like Red Door past something rather else, you know, like in, in, as a way to find a house. But I think names were important prior to numbering. And people kept that up because it was a habit. Um, but so and so it has fallen away. It still happens a little bit, but it doesn't happen that much, I think, because um, the necessity for it had gone and then, then the habit um, fell away as well. But on that subject of naming, I think the thing that I found was it's the process of finding a name that feels right that asks you to observe whatever it is. There's a, a woman, I was going to leave this slide in and I took it out, um, a woman called Linda Woodrow who's a permacultural designer, a gardener essentially, but she writes all this, uh, a lot about how she does her garden and that she names things all the time because even though she's just all about efficiency and getting as much produce as possible, she will spend enormous amounts of time finding a name for a particular um, strain of plant or a bed or, or whatever because she said the process of finding that name means that she has to observe and she has to observe closely to work out what's the best and most appropriate way of naming and that that leads to all sorts of insights that she wouldn't get otherwise um, that she would miss because permaculture is all about observation. It's a very important part of, of that process. So, you know, that's, that's the part of it. And I would, I would really, every time I do talk about this project, I say to people, please try to think of a name for your house <laughs> or, or the place where you live and it, um, or other names for the area in which you live and, and go through that process of, of trying, to, trying to do that. It seems like a silly thing, but it's actually quite powerful. So do you have any more questions? So if not, maybe... While we're still waiting for questions, I ask one more question. Um, so what about the house that you live now in Newcastle? What's the names of it? The name is Flora Ingle. Ooh. And <laughs> um, that um, came about in a number of different ways. Um, she, we were initially, I, when I first moved in, my brother and his wife moved in and, and um we're having this discussion about it for a little while and, and they said it's Fleur for some reason and there's a long story about the history of the name um, Fleur in my family history, which I won't go into, but um, I thought, no, it's kind of not quite right. It, it's um, because Fleur is the name for a flower, whereas Flora is um, a, a name for all of all flowers, if you like, like all plants. And she sits up on a... Um, on a hill, um, and it was like Little House in the Prairie. It was written by um, Laura, oh, God, I'm going a mental blank, Laura Ingalls Wilder. And so Flora Ingle is, is like a reference to Little House um, on the Prairie. And, and then my house in Melbourne is called Otto, just Otto. Um, it's, this house is more of a he. It's an art deco. Kind of, um, yeah. Kind of house. Yeah. Well, thank you again, um, Pierre, for your beautiful talks. And, you know, it's inspired me to start thinking about naming my house. Um, so I now pass the, um, to our Chancellor, Paul Jean, to conclude this presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Natalie, and and yeah, thank you. Indeed, it's already been said by some of the questioners, and uh, and Natalie, it was a very enjoyable and thought provoking talk. It certainly took a lot of uh, a lot of us to places we'd never been, <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll go on thinking about it. So, thank you very much indeed. Um, I hope the audience has enjoyed the uh, the talk. Uh, and thank you, Stuart, for uh, for facilitating the webinar, which is certainly an efficient means of uh, um, conducting these uh, these lectures when we can't be face to face. So, uh, with that, I'd like to thank everybody. Encourage once again.
people to stay uh, in touch with the Hunter Ranch. We look forward to our next uh, occasion when we'll meet. And uh, and uh, in the meantime, stay safe. Thank you.